welcome on board for a journey full of beauty and nostalgia. A chance to sit back and soak up the views as we go in search of long lost railways and the way of life that went with them. From the narrow gauge railways of North Wales to the secrets of Queen Victoria's long lost railway near Balmoral. We'll travel by train to the most spectacular scenery the British Isles has to offer. So sit back and enjoy Britain's most beautiful lost railways. It was only 180 years ago that Britain invented railways as we know them. It was an innovation that would have a huge impact on so many aspects of people's lives, not just in this country, but throughout the world. In the next hour, we'll be discovering how this new invention spread rapidly through the south of England, transforming the capital and people's everyday lives. We're heading to the beach in Brighton to ride on the world's oldest electric railway and discover why a unique railway that carried passengers above the waves didn't survive. And we'll be travelling in style, reliving the ultimate in first-class rail travel in beautifully restored Pullman coaches on the Bluebell Line. And discovering how Britain's railways fought for king and country during two world wars but were left at the brink of collapse. But first, we're going in search of signs of London's very first railway. Railway arches are such a familiar feature of the street scene in London, we hardly give them a second glance. But these arches in Bermondsey are remnants of a groundbreaking lost railway. When it opened in 1836, the London to Greenwich Railway was the first in a capital city anywhere in the world and was distinctly different from those lines that were spreading through the regions of Britain. London was already developed though and densely populated and there wasn't much space for a railway on the ground so the world's first commuter line became a railway in the sky. The London to Greenwich Railway was built by 400 navvies and stretched for nearly four miles on top of a viaduct of 878 arches. It's still the longest span of arches in Britain and an incredible 60 million bricks were used in its construction. One of the side effects of the building of the London and Greenwich was that it used up London supply of bricks for a year. You know, there were millions of bricks went into this, which you can still see today. Um, and it was uh, extraordinarily uh, large structure, if you consider over 800 arches really as one structure, four miles long all the way. It was on a scale that very little in London has been built before or since. You know, it, it's, it's one of London's largest structures. If you put it on its end, it would go up a, a four miles high. So, and it's all one structure. The builders were still unconfident about whether people would use it because they actually built a pedestrian passageway next to it, charged people a penny so they could just walk uh, the distance instead of uh, taking the train. But it was a success, and by 1844, was carrying two million passengers a year. Some of those passengers came here, to a long lost station at Spa Road. Today, you can still see traces of the original booking office in a run of arches that's now home to a number of small businesses. But windows, from which 19th century passengers bought their tickets, have long been bricked up. Close by, and so easy to miss, is the doorway that once led passengers up to the platforms, which have disappeared many years ago. In many places, the original viaduct is somewhat buried. It's been widened to carry as many as a dozen railway tracks, and still forms one of the major transport arteries into London from the southeast. But the real significance of the London and Greenwich Railway was that it pioneered commuter lines in cities across the world, 
but more immediately had a huge impact on Londoners' everyday lives. The London and Greenwich is really extraordinary, very underrated railway, uh, because it's the first railway that is built uh, within a town, with a, as an idea of a suburban railway, um, with uh, really the idea of passengers using it rather than freight, and local passengers, you know, it's a sort of commuters in a way. It uh, begins the idea of uh, commuting, which really was a new concept, and therefore the idea of uh, enabling people to live further from their work than they did before. The success of London Greenwich and other early railways across Britain led to a frenzy of investment in new lines. Railway mania reached fever pitch in 1846 when 272 Acts of Parliament were passed to create new railways. The proposed routes totaled an astonishing 9,500 miles. <laughs> And right at the height of the boom, a new company was formed, the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway, known simply as the Brighton Line. One part of its vast network, built to serve the local farming community in Sussex, is now preserved as the Bluebell Railway. In the early days, they were very prosperous. Uh, railways like this couldn't fail to be, because we actually must remember there's no anything else than slow horse transport. The roads weren't made up like they are now. People didn't have cars or lorries. And so everything was centred on the local railway station. But the decline began after the two world wars. Many soldiers came home, bought ex-army trucks, and started small haulage businesses that took freight traffic away from the railways. Goods and passenger traffic dwindled until 1955, when British Rail, who by then ran the line, decided to close it for the first time. But they were thwarted by a very colourful local character. A very formidable lady who lived up in Chaley, Mr. Miss Eleanor Rose Margaret Vesemer, who was related to the famous Steele family, discovered in fact that the closure was illegal. I briefly met her uh, back in uh, 1958, very much the headmistress of a girls' school. <laughs> That's why I can describe her. <laughs> very formidable lady and did a lot of good works in, in the area. Miss Bessemer discovered that the Act of Parliament that created the railway guaranteed a certain level of service each day. The London, Brighton and South Coast Railway stated they had to run four trains each way a day and this was the original act, and it had never been repealed. So he was able to force the British Transport Commission to reopen this line with these four statutory trains. Now this was done with considerable bad temper and bad grace. And so they ran just a one engine and one carriage at the most awkward times, didn't connect with anything in the outside world, and the thing produced a thundering loss. <laughs> Meanwhile, British Rail repealed the original act and in 1958, free from their legal obligations, closed the railway for a second time. This time, it really did look like the end of the line. The last British Rail trains ran on the 16th of March. But a remarkable thing happened. A band of students, pictured here nearly 40 years later, thought they might try and bring the lost railway back to life as a preserved line, at a time when BR was still building steam locomotives. Their efforts created the first heritage railway in Britain. At that particular time, um, you were looked upon as cranks, and, you know, grown men playing trains, this sort of thing. Um, the general public, Steam was going out, it was, well in 1960 it was still plentiful actually, steam didn't really finish till 1967. As time went by, especially after 1967, uh, people suddenly woke up to the fact that these things weren't around anymore. I mean, Britain invented the steam locomotive for heaven's sake, so you know, we had to preserve it for the future generations. After buying a single steam locomotive, the Bluebell Preservation Society carried its first paying passengers in August 1960. But even today, people would say to me, well, it's only grown men playing trains, but it isn't. I mean, when you've got a turnover of something like three million pounds, it's not playing trains, believe you me. <laughs> and so we got going in 1960 with just two engines and two carriages, which we shall celebrate next year for our 50th anniversary. I mean, here 50 years, good heavens. Perhaps because it's the oldest preserved railway in Britain, and it was in the heritage business early, 
the Bluebell has built up a remarkable collection of steam locomotives. It began saving them as soon as they started being withdrawn from service. Well, when the, the so-called modernisation came in under the British Rail Network, uh, the, well, almost a political decision was taken to electrify and dieselise the network so the steam engines were redundant. Coupled with that, people didn't want to get dirty anymore. Um, there wasn't the people available to do the mundane, really filthy, dirty tasks which is involved in maintaining these. So the steam engines were phased out as the electrification came in. The big areas, uh, loco works, uh, they just filled up with engines which were now redundant. And they just sat in the siding, either awaiting a duty or condemnation. So most of them went for scrap. When the scrapyard started taking them, they were towed down five or six at a time. Very sad. I think there was something like 16,000 engines at the end of the 50s. Um, I mean, nowadays there's about 250 standard gauge engines. The cost of bringing lost locos back to life and maintaining them once they're back in steam is colossal. An engine overhaul like Sir Archibald Sinclair, which is running today, you're probably into material costs of half a million. If you add the labour costs in, you're easily into £2 million. Uh, but it's been done over a 30-year period and no one really kept tabs on how much. <laughs> uh, Certainly, in the workshop point of view, the average overhaul for us is about 150,000. The Bluebell has restored and runs some of the oldest surviving locomotives in Britain. Fenchurch is a stridely terrier engine and was built at the Brighton Engine Works in 1872. She was the oldest engine to have worked on British Railways when she was saved from the scrapyard by the Bluebell Railway in 1964. She's a simple saturated engine powered by wet or saturated steam, the type that comes out of a kettle. Despite being nearly 140 years old, this little engine is still in regular service on the Bluebell line. By 1902, locos were already becoming more sophisticated. This is 592, a C-class engine. That's got more modern refinements like steam reversers, so rather than the driver fighting the power of the steam as he's trying to notch up a gear, or change gear for want of a better term, then it's got a steam-assisted gear to do that for you. So all you do is move a system of levers and it notches up the engine. The Earl of Barclay is another example of an early saturated engine. Built in 1899, it's a great western engine and saw most of its service in Wales. Isle of Barclay is in, quite interesting in itself. It's made out of two different engines. There was uh, two different classes. There was a Duke class and a Bulldog class. And the two engines, one part of each, wasn't very good. So the boiler on one was better than the other, the frames on the other one was better. So the Great Western Railway in the late 20s, early 30s combined the two classes to make the Duke Dog class. It's the only survivor its class. It's been here now for nearly 40 years. And it's quite popular, it's something different. Keeping steam locos like the Earl of Barclay in service required a huge and expensive infrastructure to keep them filled with water and loaded with coal. The Earl, for example, can carry six tonnes of coal and three and a half thousand gallons of water. The cost and inconvenience of keeping over 20,000 steam locomotives on the rails was one of the reasons British Rail switched to electric trains. but attempts have been made to improve the efficiency of steam locos. In the 1930s, streamlining was intended to make locos more aerodynamic. The Mallard A4 Pacific, now in the National Railway Museum in York, is perhaps the most famous example, and still holds the world record for the fastest steam train having reached 126 miles an hour in 1938. But the Duchess of Hamilton is also a bold statement that steam locos were fit for the modern age. Built in 1938, its smooth Art Deco lines looked amazing, 
but there's no proof they actually helped it run faster. The Duchess class locos were certainly the most powerful ever to run in Britain. Back at the Bluebell, there's what may be mistaken for a streamlined loco in the engine shed, Blackmore Vale. Originally, this giant engine cost £17,000 to build and went into service in 1946, but its sleek lines are not to make it streamlined. The Blackmore Vale's version is air smoothed and that was done primarily so that it could go for a carriage washing plant. So it has the same shape outside as a carriage made it easy to clean. So, uh, again, you're into a period where people didn't want to get dirty. Blackmore Vale is awaiting a major refit. The biggest loco running on the Blue Bell today is Sir Archibald Sinclair. He's an awesome Battle of Britain class locomotive. The class was to commemorate the famous World War II battle that was fought mostly over the Southern Railway's territory. It's named after one of Winston Churchill's most trusted wartime aides and former leader of the Liberal Party. Built in 1947, it's a much more sophisticated locomotive than the older ones at the Bluebell, using superheated steam. So Archibald was purchased in 1979 from Woodham Scrapyard Barry. Um, came here October, and well, as we now know, it's taken 30 years to overhaul it. <laughs> Uh, it's superheated, it's a big, if you like, express engine. It's built for long distance work, large wheels, high speed, easily capable of 100 miles an hour, um, 300 miles plus, you know, between servicing intervals. The superheating works by taking the steam, reheating it, and therefore you get more work from the steam. Archibald weighs 128 tonnes, so yes, it's a big engine. Um, its capabilities here are a little bit wasted for a railway where we only hang uh, six carriages behind it, uh, so 240 to 250 tonnes, 25 miles an hour. So in terms of seeing it for its best, then it's like a big, uh, a big animal in a cage. In an attempt to standardise its steam locomotives, British Rail took the best features of the best locos from the former Big Four railway companies and merged them, eventually coming up with the standard tank engine. 80151 is an example of this last generation of steam locomotives that proved to be both reliable and flexible in the dying days of steam. 80151, uh, if you like, represents the climax of the loco development. Nice 264 tank engine, so built for bi-directional running, so branch lines where it couldn't uh, go on the turntable. Superheated, so relatively economic, compact. In terms of design, it, it had all the modern day refinements. Nice enclosed cab, even got padded seats. Very easy to drive, very easy to fire. A bit of a nightmare because of all the mod cons on there. Everything's crammed in, so maintenance-wise is a little bit difficult. Having said that, there's remote greasing, so you haven't got to go around with loads and loads of oil points. There's grease everywhere. Locomotives may be the stars of preserved railways, but in the days of steam, only engine drivers and their trusty firemen got to be this hands-on. The travelling public's perception of the railways is more influenced by the creature comforts of their carriages, or lack of them. The first ever railway, the Stockton and Darlington, was never conceived as a passenger service. So, on the opening day in 1825, most passengers had to travel in converted coal trucks. Even the VIP's specially built coach experiment was a very basic affair. These replicas in the National Railway Museum show conditions had improved slightly on the more passenger-friendly Liverpool to Manchester Railway five years later. If you had money and you could afford first class, no problems. You had a roof, you had nice cushioned seating, fantastic. The instant you got to third class, you had timber seats, you had no roof, and if it rained, you got wet. But as railways developed over the next hundred years, so did passenger comforts, reaching the ultimate in luxury travel in the 1920s with Pullman coaches. These have been lovingly restored to their former glory by a dedicated team of specialist coach builders and volunteers at the Bluebell Railway. 
But to really understand the scale of challenges they face, this is one of their current projects. It's a brake van, thought to date from around 1858. To the untrained eye, it may look a complete wreck, but to the Bluebell restoration team, it's pretty complete for a railway carriage that's over 150 years old. Here at the Bluebell, we restore our own coaches. We have done since day one, and we will probably continue for the foreseeable future. We can have anything up to about five carriages on the go at any one time. Carriages can take anywhere between three years up to anything like 15 years. It all depends on the complexity of the vehicle, the amount of manpower that is available, and the amount of money. It's always an interesting subject. Also, the manufacture of the new parts because it's not something you can go down to B&Q and just purchase a new bracket, for example. You actually have to make it. Sometimes you have to make patterns, then get them cast, then you have to machine them. Other times you have to go and get um, very exotic timbers imported just so you can make it as it was. But the results of years of dedication and craftsmanship are astounding. This first-class London, Brighton and South Coast railway coach was turned into part of a bungalow after it was withdrawn from service in 1924. Quite a common fate for old railway carriages. It was only when the bungalow was demolished in the 1980s that the remains of the carriage were transported to the Bluebell to begin restoration. Close by, in the carriage shed, is a third-class brake coach built for the London, Chatham and Dover Railway in 1889. It had accommodation for the train guard as well as passengers. Well, 114 is quite an interesting little coach. It's got a varnished teak body on it, which is actually quite awkward to maintain. Um, they don't really like being out in the weather, but it was the, the, the dumb thing in the era. The guard basically would have helped passengers with their luggage and so on. There's also a dog box in 114. The guard is charged with the safety of a train because he has to depart the train in a safe manner, ensure all the doors are closed, um, that no passengers are hanging out, um, that sort of thing. Most of the Bluebell's restored coaches are in regular traffic on the restored line, carrying passengers as they've always done. This smart set was built for the London Underground's Metropolitan Line in 1898. The Metropolitans, we obtained them in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, so we've had them for quite a while now. They were the last running set um, on London Underground at the time. Ours is a bit of an oddball set is because they actually ran as a set of three. But when we purchased them, we were fortunate enough to obtain a second centre car and we've now changed it to a four coach set. Um, they are a little temperamental to maintain, being you know, given their age and also their varnished teak um, exterior. But on the other hand, they are a very popular coach and we use them quite a lot for our Victorian themed events. This coach is very popular too because it gives them fantastic views. These observation cars are a lost feature of many scenic lines. Fifteen oh three, the observation car or the OBO as we call it was built in 1913 and was built for a specific line in Wales. There was three of them built, this being the only remaining example. 1503 is a very special vehicle in the fact that normally you don't get so good a view out of a railway carriage as you do out of it. The amount of glass in it is actually quite good. This was the ideal vehicle to throw on the end of a train and have a look at, this, at the marvellous scenery that you travel through. It's not that troublesome to look after, no. Um, we use it a lot, it's had a long history here. It's one of our most popular carriages and we tend to use it for a lot of specials, using it for the original ideas that it was originally built for so you can view the line. Today, tourists provide the lifeblood for preserved lines like the Bluebell and taking the train on days out or on holiday is something we all take for granted. But it's easy to forget that the railways invented travelling for pleasure, for ordinary people at least. From the earliest days of the Liverpool to Manchester Railway, special trains have been arranged for organised day trips, 
1841, cabinet maker Thomas Cook, whose name was to become synonymous with mass tourism, chartered a train to take 570 temperance campaigners 11 miles from Leicester to Loughborough. But 10 years later, one event had over 6 million people on the move. It was the Great Exhibition in London, and most visitors went there by train. You have to think of this in terms of the fact that before you had a railway, you know, people living particularly in the countryside might really never go out of their village more than once or twice a year, and then only to the local market town. Suddenly, you know, pl places were connected with London, connected with the capital, and the Great Exhibition was uh, the real stimulant of this. You know, suddenly there was a reason to go out to London. People would go from everywhere around the country. The railways would compete for their customs, so they reduced the prices. They would create special excursion trains. You know, every small village might uh, organize a train or a carriage on a train to go up there. Um, and you know, suddenly people realized that they could travel around even you know, if they weren't particularly rich. As probably as long as they had a job, they could probably afford to, to, to go up to London for this exhibition and, and uh, uh, see the sights in a, in a way that they never could have done before. Affordable rail travel opened up the delights of the seaside. Coastal towns expanded rapidly. On the south coast, Brighton developed its own railway attractions to entertain its new breed of visitors. Thanks to a local inventor, the son of a German clockmaker, Magnus Volk. Even as a teenager, Volk was fascinated by electricity. In 1880, when there was still no domestic electricity supply, he created his own with a generator in his garden shed. But he was determined to use electricity for transport, and in 1882 opened an electric-powered railway that ran 300 yards along Brighton Beach. And people didn't believe that it could work because there was no steam engine and there was no horses to pull it. It worked by magic because they couldn't see an engine pulling it. The carriage moved on its own and almost silently. Uh, and in fact, the vicar of Brighton denounced the railway as the work of Satan and forbade his parishioners to come anywhere near it. But that just whetted people's appetite and they flocked to it, as you can imagine. It was immensely popular with tourists, to the dismay of the people who lived at this part of town, because they thought, they called them the Bag and Bottle Brigade, uh, and they thought that the railway would bring those people to Kemp Town, which is on the cliff behind us, and which is rather a salubrious area at that time. In 1896, Volk wanted to extend his railway three miles east to Rottingdean, along a section of beach that was often covered by the sea. He decided the only possible answer was to design a railway that could run on tracks covered in water. And he came up with a rather strange contraption, which he called Pioneer. And it stood on legs 24 feet high, and that gave it its nickname, because as soon as the local people saw it, they nicknamed it Daddy Longlegs. It ran on the beach on four rails because each leg had four wheels. So the track was laid on concrete blocks, 18 feet apart. Uh, it had an overhead wire because you couldn't have the electric motor under the water, so the electricity came from overhead. And it stood on four legs, as I said, about 24 feet high. There was a deck about 50 feet long. On the top there was a luxurious cabin. I mean, this is Victoriana at its peak because the cabin had velvet curtains, stained glass windows, chandeliers and potted palms. You don't get those on a railway very often. Uh, and then the Board of Trade, which was the forerunner of health and safety, uh, insisted that it carried life belt and a lifeboat. At high tide, it took over an hour to get to Rottingdean, when you couldn't walk it that quickly. So it was essentially for tourists. He advertised it as a sea voyage on wheels. You could travel over the sea without getting seasick, and that was its charm. Well, it's difficult to call it groundbreaking in view of the fact it was the only one of its kind ever built. Uh, in that, that respect, it was unique. In 1900, the local council was responsible for the demise of this extraordinary railway. It built breakwaters to stop the beach being eroded by the tide across part of the Daddy Longlegs track. Volk couldn't afford to reroute it, so this eccentric form of rail travel was lost. I 
But Volk's first railway survives and is the oldest electric railway in the world, though only thanks to evasive action taken during the Second World War. Halfway station! This is the halfway! In 1940, the government closed all the beaches on the south coast for the duration of the war, and the railway had to close, and the stations were demolished. The carriages were moved from here to across the road, where there are arches, uh, cast iron arches. They were stored under there for the next eight years, uh, and the railway could have disappeared, and parts of the track were taken up for scrap for the war effort. And it was only in 1948 that the council decided to rebuild it. It thrives today. We don't perhaps have as many visitors as we did in the immediate post-war period because so many holiday makers go abroad for their holidays. On a nice day like today, it'll be packed and uh, people just love it because it's such a pleasant way of travelling along the promenade. I think as a pioneer of electricity, he was immensely important. He showed what could be done. Uh, when the Southern Railway, the London to Brighton line, was electrified in 1932. They had a big banquet in Brighton Town Hall and the chairman of the Southern Railway said, well, of course, Mr. Volk showed us how to do this 49 years ago and it's taken us all this time to catch up with him. And I think he showed that electric traction was possible. Uh, and in that respect, it is enormously important. It is now the oldest working electric railway in the world. Tourism became big business for railway companies, and nowhere was the battle for holiday traffic fought more fiercely than in the southwest of England. Two rival companies, the Great Western and what became Southern Railways, both had iconic trains on routes from London to Devon and Cornwall. In 1904, the Great Western started running the Cornish Riviera Express from Paddington to Penzance. And in 1926, the Southern ran the Atlantic Coast Express from Waterloo to several destinations in Devon and Cornwall. But the battle wasn't just about the relative merits of the trains. It became a war of words in the railway industry's first full-scale marketing campaign, designed to make tourists choose their route to what, in the words of the marketing men, was a foreign land. The message was sold in a number of posters, brochures and specially commissioned books because right from the outset, the Great Western established for its readers and for those who saw its early posters, that what they were going to was not another part of England. It was totally different. It was a foreign country and they marketed it as a foreign country. And the idea was that you no longer had to endure the journey by ship or by train or combinations of both to the Mediterranean. Now, by the Cornish Riviera, you almost flew, as it were, to the West Country. Stylish people in a very stylish train heading for the most stylish of locations. They made very, very clear comparisons with anything Mediterranean. They did it both visually through their poster work and their brochures, and they did it with remarkable skill in terms of their, their literature. If I could give you an example, perhaps. I mean, we have in the, uh, the book, The Cornish Riviera itself, it says, the pilgrim to Penzance in search of either health, rest, or change need have no fear of dullness. If he walks in the Marab Gardens, where a good band plays amongst a wealth of subtropical vegetation, which Nice or Monte Carlo might envy, he may, without any stretch of the imagination, fancy himself in Algiers. You've got that one writer, S.P.B. Mays, who wrote a book called The Cornish Riviera. And he argued in there, uh, well, it's, it's almost infamous now, he said, uh, Panzance may be compared to Madeira, the Scillies to the Azores, and most wonderful of all, I think, Mullion to Monte Carlo. Now, if you've been to Mullion, it's not Monte Carlo. <laughs> the Southern Railway took a more abstract and some would say more innovative approach to persuading holidaymakers to use their trains to get to winter sunshine. <laughs> 
the Great Western's romantic and narrative approach had full backing from the railway's general manager, Felix Pohl. He'd worked in the marketing department and put massive resources behind their campaign, including sending his staff to Southwest Chambers of Commerce to persuade business leaders that they should play the foreign card to attract tourists. This is an example of a late 30s brochure on Cornwall. They, they were very high quality, gloss paper and so on. I mean, what you've got in this particular one is, is a, an illustration of what they considered to be the essential Cornish village. I mean, in this particular example, they've, they, they've taken two different locations and put them together. But what you've got is sort of quintessential Cornwall, as the Great Western wanted it to be presented. I mean, if, I mean, if we talk about the real Cornwall and the Great Western's version of Cornwall, there would be slight uh, discrepancies, but, uh, but as a marketing tool, it was, it was certainly successful. What a lot of these brochures and booklets uh, did reflect was the sense of deep affection and regard for your country. There, there was the sense of know your country, see your country, and, and in the 1930s, the patriotic duty was not to go abroad, but to stay here in Britain and see your country. And as the Southern would say, go Southern, and as the Great Western put it, go Great Western. While some railway companies were working furiously to promote their services to the general public, it was quality and attention to detail that was the winning combination for the most discerning passengers. Now, one name that became synonymous with luxury rail travel was George Mortimer Pullman. Pullman was an American furniture salesman who developed luxury interiors for coaches after becoming fed up with the standard of accommodation on his country's railroads. The Brighton Line became the first to introduce Pullman levels of refinement in the UK. These days, original Pullman coaches run on a number of heritage railways in Britain, but some of the best are at the Bluebell Railway in Sussex. Its high-class dining service is a tribute to a famous train that provided the UK leg of an opulent journey from London to Paris, the Golden Arrow. The service started in 1929 from Victoria Station to Dover, where passengers continued across the channel in the first-class lounges of a ferry. After arriving at port, they continued to the French capital, again in Pullman carriages on the French Flèche d'Or. Anyone who was anyone at that time in the 1920s would um, obviously take their pleasure in Paris. Paris was the, 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 the centre of the universe to many people, particularly the cultural aspects and also the fashions. You had uh, Coco Chanel who was becoming so popular in the early 20s and she was making her name very well known. You had Maurice Chevalier and Kay Kendall and all the rank starlets used to travel on the Golden Arrow and it was, it was sensational. All the magazines had this in, um, uh, quite appropriate um, uh, photography of the arrow in the background, so people recognised that the arrow was a special service. It was a very relaxed, civilised form of travel. There was no rushing. So you had even a porter taking on board your luggage. Um, you had the attendants constantly asking, are you OK, would you like something else, madam or sir? And that is what part and parcel of the, of the Pullman right. ideal, isn't it? Can I tempt you, sir? <laughs> and I thought, yes, you can tempt yes, me. Yes, indeed. <laughs> You've got to remember, the Pullman, the Pullman Company was a, was a limited company, so it was quite private. It was a, a closed order. Most of the attendants would be long-serving attendants, and they had their ways, they had unique ways. They looked after their, their special guests, particularly if it was royalty or, or state arrivals. The tradition was very important, and that was instilled in their training. Pullman passengers traveled in splendor. Every car, uh, these should not be referred to as carriages, was individually designed and appointed. There was incredible attention to detail in all the fittings and fixtures. 
from the marquetry panels, the hat racks, to other onboard conveniences. This may look like the ultimate way to travel, but this car is actually third class. Even Pullman was forced to make concessions when the economic depression of the 1930s began to bite. But this car, Fingal, beautifully restored by the Bluebells carriage department, is a stunning example of Pullman first class. These cars were built to impress in many forms. It's not just the interiors, it's the exterior as well. They had evocative names. They had um, some of the cars, of course, they were third class. So it was car number, what have you. Yes, and, and that was still um, a, a so much <clears throat> more in the way of superiorness than, than you would see on yeah. an ordinary first class car. So a second class passenger had the benefits of, of, the, of the Golden Arrow service. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hassison got his first taste of Pullman travel when he was a boy, when he travelled with his father. I first travelled in August 48. That was the first time I ever went on the Golden Arrow. And we got to Victoria, and what did I know? I'd never been on these trains before. We got to Victoria, and there was this magnificent arch leading into the platform, and there was a rake of all Pullman cars. It was an eye-opener to me. White-jacketed attendants who, who ushered you into the cars, and you can see the magnificent interiors. We had these comfortable armchairs, large windows to look out for, this beautiful marquetry we had. And the food, I have to say, was first class because we still had rationing. We didn't finish rationing completely until July 40, 1954, after all. So for, for me, I mean, I was about 20 in those days. It was an absolute eye-opener. We had this wonderful car and we sat there and, you know, you were served there and you could see the view outside the window and you thought, there's drab England outside and there's this luxury England inside. It was, it was such a contrast, it was such a wonderful feeling. I thought, well, you know, it's a privilege and I was very pleased that I could be so pampered just for once. It was wonderful because we didn't have this ordinarily, obviously, with so much austerity and so much rationing, it, it, just, it just wasn't possible. So, as I say, I felt completely different just for a while. It, it hooked me on Pullman's forever. So champagne and, and, and other things were in abundance, I Oh, absolutely. Yes, you yes. could have anything you wanted, practically. Yes. So I, I felt, you know, I felt like a million dollars sometimes. Today, the Golden Arrow experience is recreated on the Blue Bell with special dining trains, which are popular with wedding parties. It's a unique chance to get a taste of Pullman dining, 1920s and 30s style. This particular item here is one of the um, paper tickets issued on board the Golden Arrow rather than an Edmondson ticket which was issued before travel. And, and this um, was for, uh, from 1965, uh, it makes it very clear, it's uh, on the 5th of December 1965, for six shillings. And this is a supplementary fare above the ordinary first class single or return. So always, but always, uh, post-war, most Pullman trains had um, supplementary fares, but there were some pre-war which did not. Well, a supplement was um, for the Pullman car company. This is what kept the Pullmans actually on the line. Um, so it was their revenue. Uh, and it's a private revenue. The next item, now this in itself is a very rare item. It dates from about 1946-47 and it was uh, for all passengers on the, the Golden Arrow um, at the table. So each table would have a napkin and this is damask silk um, embroidered with Golden Arrow in blue and, and a Golden Arrow. The next item is a typical Pullman menu. I think this is 1955, Christmas 1955, a typical bill of fare. And in this instance, it's a luncheon menu with rich oxtail soup with golden croutons. Always golden croutons was the added ingredient in any soups given on the Pullman trains. And you can see here, this is a Christmas fare, so it would be uh, roast Norfolk turkey. They used, Pullman always, but always used um, some extra words to make it sound fanciful. So the, 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 the carrots, for example, were never from um, uh, the tin. They were always from Wiltshire or from Kent. So it was Kentish carrots or, or Dover, uh, Dover um, sole with, with um, Brussels sprouts, especially from Norfolk or something like that. Uh, but this is quite, quite unique. Um, and on the other side, you'll see that there, there are a number of wines available, including the customary champagne. And finally, now this item 
would have been discarded generally. And it is a, um, a cigarette packet only for passengers on board the Golden Arrow. And it is, again, it gave it a distinctiveness because it says, as sold to passengers on the Golden Arrow train, so it would be unique. Invariably, they were Abdullah, which was a very famous make uh, from the 1920s into the 40s. And um, this is just a unique example. As you can see here, it makes reference to Abdullah cigarettes, which were Egyptian or Turkish. With luxury trains withdrawn and no cross-channel travel for civilians during the war, many Pullman coaches were pushed into sidings and left for five or six years. Many needed restoration before they were brought back into service. In the post-war years, the Golden Arrow service faced direct competition from airlines, and despite the introduction of second-class coaches to give it wider appeal, this unique service was lost in 1972, followed by all other Pullman services in Britain by 1985. The BR policy at that time, certainly in about 1965-66, uh, made it very clear that uh, the old Pullman cars, they, they were more or less veritable museum pieces, and some of them were actually reaching their 40th year. So, of course, the interiors were old-fashioned. They didn't really present a modern image for British Railways, who wanted to try and um, uh, basically eradicate all steam locomotives and introduce diesel and electric. And the Pullmans were a link with the past. So thereafter, most Pullman services were redrawn, including the Brighton Bell, obviously the Golden Arrow, the Yorkshire Pullman, the Teestime Pullman, the Bristol Pullman, the, the South Wales Pullman. They all went. In their day, special trains like the Golden Arrow and the Bournemouth, Brighton and Devon Bells were the flagships of the railway companies that ran them. But even the kudos they brought didn't save them when tastes changed and railway finances came under extreme pressure in the 1960s and 70s. But the railway companies had a more enduring way to express their corporate pride. These days, when we live in a culture of complaint about the railways, it's difficult to imagine how different things were in the late 1800s. Then the big railway companies were at the forefront of technology, leading the biggest transport revolution the world had ever seen. They had money, confidence and power, and nothing expressed that more than their buildings. London stations were far more than places to catch trains. Some, like Cannon Street and St Pancras, were fronted by awesome railway hotels. The Portland Stone of Waterloo matched the grandeur of any building in Whitehall, but no mainline stations were allowed in the heart of the capital. One idea was to have one central huge station uh, somewhere near the city that would have served all directions, but clearly it would have destroyed so much uh, part, of, so much as a great chunk of the city that it was impossible to do. So instead, they decided that railway should not go. Uh, into the centre, but be round this uh, uh, periphery uh, a couple of miles from the actual centre, and that instead would have an underground line, the circle line, joining all the stations together, and that the stations would not be able to penetrate uh, through this. One of the earliest railway stations to do this was Euston, not the one we see today, but a long lost monument to the railway age. Well, the Euston Station had one of the finest pieces of railway architecture uh, in the world, not just in, in Britain. It was a large uh, classical Doric, Grecian Doric arch, and uh, it was built uh, because the London and Birmingham Railway realised that they were a, a new force in the land. The London and Birmingham Railway directors realised this and said, right, uh, uh, we are now regarded as the gateway to the north, so we're going to build a grand station to prove it. And they certainly did. It was in the 1970s when Euston Station was rebuilt. It was decided that the arch had to go because the land was needed for uh, the new station. It's a great pity, but um, history is like that, full of these sort of uh, um, mistakes. There was a terrible outcry at the time. Uh, Sir John Betjeman was one of the leading voices to d express uh, dismay and disapproval. But it wasn't the fashion in those days. Victorian architecture wasn't recognised then as something of any value. People were getting rid of it as quickly as they could. So the, the arch went. <laughs> 
There's nothing left of Euston, the old Euston now, but there are two interesting, uh, slightly uh, newer relics, if I can put it that way. Uh, on Euston Road itself, there are two gate lodges. They were built later on by the London and Birmingham Railway's successor, uh, and they've got some rather interesting gilt lettering around them. They're all destinations, they're all places like Leamington Spa and Carlisle and Leeds and even Swansea. Well, you'd never dream of going to Swansea from Euston these days, but you could at one time. It was a, an exercise in public relations, if you like, saying what a large widespread uh, railway company we are. You can get to all these places. The fact that they were, a lot of them were by very roundabout routes, certainly not the most direct one, uh, that, that didn't matter. Waterloo Station opened in 1848 and after much remodelling in later years became the largest station in the UK, covering over 24 acres. Today's travellers are familiar with the Victory Arch. Built from Portland stone, it commemorates the employees of the London and South Western Railway who lost their lives in the First World War. But there's a macabre part of the station that's been lost, with platforms exclusively for the dead. Around the corner at 121 Westminster Bridge Road, you can still see the entrance to the London Necropolis Railway, the terminus for what railway workers called, with typical graveyard humour, the Stiffs Express. At the beginning of the 20th century, uh, London was uh, becoming very short of graveyards. You know, it was full up for the dead, as it were. So uh, a huge area of land in Brookwood, about 30 miles away, uh, was designated a, as, a, as a graveyard. Um, but the problem was getting there. So the idea was that you create a special uh, railway station called Waterloo Necropolis um, and have special trains uh, transporting out uh, the dead and the mourners out to uh, the uh, cemetery. And it was quite complicated because you had to have uh, different trains for different denominations and they were slightly in different parts of the, of the uh, graveyard. Um, and you, know, you had uh, first and second and third class uh, trains so that you know, the, 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 the dead who were rich uh, kind of travelled in uh, better accommodation than those who were poor and so on. So it was a, it was a complicated uh, process, but quite a successful one. And there were other such uh, um, graveyards sprung up uh, in also north of London as well. So it wasn't, it wasn't the only one, but it was the biggest one. The station was high level. Uh, so the, 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 on, the, on the viaduct, so the, the funeral party would uh, pull up outside the station, the coffin would be taken inside, uh, there was a, a hydraulic lift which would take it up to platform level and there it was loaded into a special van on the, on the back of the funeral train and all the uh, people, the uh, friends and relations who were attending the funeral would occupy the compartments in the train which had its own locomotive and off it went to, to Brookwood. Uh, switched into the sidings at, at Rookwood to the uh, special uh, necropolis station at the other end of the line. And there were two. There's one station for uh, Anglicans and the other one for Roman Catholics and nonconformists. Only the station entrance survives. The platforms of this unique London station were destroyed by bombs during the Second World War. Another station that suffered during wartime was Cannon Street, built at the end of a bridge across the Thames by the South Eastern Railway in 1866. Its original ornate glass roof was carefully removed to protect it from German bombs, but unfortunately was destroyed when the factory it was being stored in received a direct hit. Today, all that remains of the grand five-storey station hotel are two 135-foot Christopher Wren-style towers which face the River Thames. If there's one London station that epitomises the power of the Victorian railway companies, it's St Pancras, opened by the Great Midland Railway in 1868. 20,000 Londoners were made homeless when the Great Midland laid its four-line track through the slums of Eger Town and Somers Town. The railway companies were a pretty ruthless bunch when it came to 
uh, trying to ensure they got the route they wanted. And nothing exemplifies that more than uh, the Midland driving their railway through to St Pancras. It's quite late in the process, so London has become much more developed. Um, and it cuts through a whole swathe of uh, North London, destroys Agar Town, a, a whole area, uh, which contrary to the propaganda of the Midland, was not actually slums, but some of it was perfectly uh, good property. But they just drive their way through that, they get their bill, and they throw thousands of people out of their homes. And uh, at that time, they didn't even need to uh, uh, do anything to compensate them or provide them with alternative uh, accommodation. So they, they're just given a week's notice and out on the streets. Even the dead couldn't escape the disruption caused by the building of the station. Its main line was to go over an ancient graveyard. The poet and author Thomas Hardy was a trainee architect at the time and given the macabre job of overseeing the removal of coffins, bodies and headstones to make way for the railway. The experience clearly affected him. In a poem written later, the dead speak directly to the rail traveller. O passenger, pray list and catch our sighs and piteous groans, half stifled in this jumbled patch of wrenched memorial stones. We late lamented, resting here, are mixed to human jam. And each to each exclaims in fear, I know not which I am. The result, however, was a station with a train shed that became the largest enclosed space in the world when it was completed. Recently, it's been restored to its former glory as part of the development of the new Eurostar terminus, St Pancras International. One of the great glories of St Pancras, once you get inside it, is that grand uh, arch train shed. When it was built, it was the largest of its kind in the world, uh, and it's still well up in the, in the top uh, two or three. Uh, it's uh, entirely unsupported, uh, apart from the, uh, except at the sides, and it was designed by an engineer called William Henry Barlow, who was the Rail Midland Railway's chief engineer. And it, a lot of uh, commentators at the time said they called it this uh, enormous hump and they said it's simply the Midland Railway Company showing off. They don't need anything that size. The smart shops below the platform level in today's station are in archways whose dimensions are based on the size of beer barrels. A large part of the railway's income came from carrying huge volumes of beer from Burton-on-Trent into the capital. The arches were built to store it. Indeed, it suggested that if it wasn't for beer, the railway wouldn't have been able to afford the Gothic facade of its Midland Grand Hotel that's such an iconic feature of the station. But even this awesome structure was almost lost during the 1960s when plans were announced to flatten it. It's, it's been said that if Euston hadn't been demolished, then we would probably have lost St Pancras as well. Uh, but because of the outcry over Euston, it awakened public awareness of uh, the growing importance of, um, to the heritage of uh, Victorian architecture, certainly a place like St Pancras. So again, an outcry when proposals were made to pull it down, and Sir John Betjeman again was involved. St Pancras quite simply was saved through sheer public opinion. Thirty years after St Pancras was built, London got its last mainline station at Marylebone. It's a huge contrast because by the time it was built by the Great Central Railway in 1899, things had changed. The railways were making less money. The days of building stations as monuments to the railway age had gone. There's nothing really very grand about uh, Marylebone, as there were not like the, some of the earlier stations. Uh, it didn't have an overall roof for a start. It had individual awnings over the platforms. Um, it's uh, modestly um, impressive uh, from the outside, but not to, to, to nothing like the extent of earlier ones. And it doesn't have a hotel as its frontage. The hotel was built across the road. Uh, by a separate company made up of directors of the Great Central Railway, and it was connected to the station by a, by a, a glass-roofed covered way.
The railway that ran into it, the Great Central, never made its shareholders any money and would eventually become the first main line to close as a result of the Beaching Acts in the 1960s. But all the railways had to face a much bigger challenge before that, the devastating impact of two world wars. There were at least 120 separate railway companies operating in Britain when the First World War broke out in 1914. The railways really came into their own in the uh, First World War. Uh, and, and there was a, a, a element of luck there. Because we had built so many railways and there was a lot of duplication and, and lines that now are long closed, but they'd stayed open. And uh, that proved very useful because you could uh, uh, use all these lines to, to, to run trains. So Southampton, for example, was connected by five or six different routes um, and was, was you know, the hub, one of the hubs of, of getting people over to uh, France, as was Dover and, and Folkestone. And uh, all these places had you know, hundreds of trains, fantastically well organised. <laughs> The war had proved how efficiently the railways could be run and in 1921 the 120 companies were merged into the Big Four, the Great Western, the London and North Eastern, the London Midland and Scottish and the Southern Railway. It was these companies that were to make an even greater contribution to the nation in World War II. The railways, of course, used to be the primary form of transport. Uh, certainly when they were first built and developed in the 19th century, there was nothing to touch them. Now, obviously, come the 20th century, then road became uh, important and eventually came to predominate. But during the two world wars, the rail transport was absolutely critical. And I think it's fair to say that uh, the country could not have won the Second World War without the contribution the railways made. There was a vast amount of material to be carried uh, by rail. Uh, you saw the whole of the east of England turned into almost one huge airfield and all the material to build those came by train. There was the famous saying, is your journey really necessary? Because the railway was up to and beyond its capacity moving goods, moving uh, war supplies and moving the people needed to support the war, uh, the troops and, and all that went with it. <laughs> This enormous effort is commemorated on the North Yorkshire Moors Railway each autumn when it holds a special war weekend. We take uh, Pickering and the whole of the railway back to the mid-1940s. Really, this is what it was like in North Yorkshire in 1943. So you've got the trains, and yes, we get a lot of people. We get very busy trains, which, again, is an indication of what it was like travelling by train at those times. Uh, but I think what makes it, of course, is the hundreds of people who come along dressed up in the clothing in the styles of the day, some in military uniform, but a lot of them just representing the general styles uh, and fashion of, of those particular times, and the music. There's a lot of musical entertainment, all the songs, all the nostalgia that went with that particular period. One of the biggest wartime railway disasters happened on this piece of track just outside the Cambridgeshire town of Soham. Today, the line remains, but there's not a trace of the station that stood on this site. It was completely obliterated in the biggest single explosion on British soil during World War II, but the heroic actions of four railwaymen prevented the entire town from being destroyed. The accident happened in the dead of night on June the 2nd, 1944, just four days before D-Day, when the crew of a blacked out War Department locomotive were pulling 44 trucks packed with bombs, fuses and detonators through the station at Soham. As it approaches Soham station, the driver Ben Gimber lifts the flap to check the cargo and sees it's on fire. It's, it's obviously an emergency. He has to get himself together, really, to very carefully pull the train to a stop. He gives the fireman, James Nightall, a hammer with which to uncouple the burning wagon from the remainder of the wagons. So James uncouples the wagon. Meantime, Ben's pulling the train forward very slowly. His idea is to get this inferno of the train out into open countryside and to bail out, to let it explode in open countryside. He leans out of the driver's window, 
and talks to the signalman at the station, Frank Bridges. He asks Frank Bridges to signal ahead and stop oncoming trains. At that moment, the wagon explodes. The fireman, James Nightall, who was 22, and the station master, Frank Bridges, were killed in the blast. But miraculously, the driver, Ben Gimbert, survived, as did the guard, Herbert Clark, who was in the back of the train and blown off his feet by the explosion, but then crawled along the track on his knees, laying detonators to warn other trains that the track was blocked. Two Soham residents will never forget the disaster. Kath Day was 15, and Pat Skeels only 11 when the train exploded. It was pitch dark, and I was in bed with my two sisters, and my mother yelled, get under the bed quick. But there was, there was so much dust flying around, I thought we were being gassed, so I pulled the covers over our heads. We lay there for a bit, and then we emerged, and my mother, who was in the other room with my brother, who was in a cot, um, said we'd better go downstairs, but all the uh, stairs had been blown down and so we scrambled over, um, all the ceiling was down. We managed to get downstairs and got under the table. <laughs> Didn't know, we all sat under the kitchen table where we sat for ages. All the soot had been blown down the chimney, so the whole place was covered in, everything you touched was black. And we sat under there for a long, long time. Didn't know what happened and eventually my father's uncle knocked on the front door and my mother went to the door and as she opened it the door fell onto her, a big heavy door and it fell onto her because the blast had knocked out everybody's uh, latches and hinges so all the doors fell out. Kath heard the explosion but it was the next evening when a friend escorted her to what had been the railway station that she realised the scale of the devastation. I thought, I'm going to have a look, see what's going on. So I gets on my bike, goes down to the station. Oh, it, well, it was unrecognisable because the station house itself was just a pile of rubble. I mean, Mr and Mrs Oliver mm -hmm. and Pat Oliver. How they how survived, they, I how do they not know. Survived. Yeah. They, they were injured but pretty badly, I believe, mm -hmm. but yes. And Donna's house, the wall was completely... Mm -hmm gone and, and you could see the bed and, and what tickled us and Ted who was with me said look at that the chamber pot was still sitting under the bed <laughs> so we had a giggle over that <laughs> the thing that struck me most was the enormous crater they had already pulled the engine out and it was huge and I thought however are they going to fill that up but they did, and the, the trains were working again the next day. But the real miracle was that despite widespread injuries throughout Soham, there were no fatalities, apart from the firemen and station master who gave their own lives to save the town. These heroic railway men and the brave driver and guard who survived are remembered with a memorial in the heart of Soham. And it became known the day after it happened. You know, I couldn't believe their bravery. I mean, goodness, they were only ordinary people, weren't they? And yet they did an extraordinary thing. Yes. Wonderful. Mm. Britain's railway network made an enormous contribution to World War II, but the effort brought it to its knees. Locomotives and carriages were worn out, track, tunnels, bridges and stations had been neglected, and it was against this background that the government decided to push ahead with nationalisation, and the big four railway companies became one. British Rail was formed on the 1st of January 1948, and a new era of rationalisation and cuts had begun. The railways would never be the same again, and it was the nation's most remote and beautiful railways that were the most under threat.